Karen, it's very nice to meet you. How have you been? Panoram began as a small group of Asian and Asian American women who were enrolled in graduate theological institutions or working in ministry in the United States back in 1948. Before Panada, several Asian American members from the West Coast were active in PACT, Pacific Asian Center for Theology and Strategies. Over the years, our network has expanded and 2021 marks our 36th year. This evening's event is Connecting and Reconnecting. We are creating community together, and this is also our first time to have a virtual conference. We have three wonderful panelists today, and each panelist will share uh, wonderful stories about how they have been. And then all of these speakers do not need extra introduction. So our panelists today include Mayan Lutren and Vida Nakashima Brock and Sister Mary John Manansan. So our first speaker will be Mayan Tren. So Mayan, how have you been? I've been tired, Christine. <laughs> thank you. Um, first of all, thank you so much to the, the amazing creative um, planners uh, of this event. Um, and I appreciate them so much for inviting us to step into this space with this wonderful question. How have you been? Have you eaten? Right, which is also another question that you would get asked if you come into a, a familial gathering of, of, uh, of Asian uh, kinfolk. Uh, have you had rice, for instance? That's actually a real question depending on your time zone. Um, uh, and, and, and for those of you who, you know, kind of the behind the scenes thing right before we started formally, uh, amazing women, uh, um, leaders, scholars, trying to coach one another on how we can appear uh, brightly on Zoom screens. It's, you can imagine, you know, the, the aunties and the grandmas and the mamas and the sisters kind of trying to check you um, up and, and see how you are when you walk into a big family gathering. That's how it feels like for Pan Autumn whenever we gather together. So I, I thank you for the organizers for thinking of that and trying to embody that ethos for us. Um, I have been tired. Um, my name is Mayan Tran. I work at a small, you know, freestanding seminary in the Chicago area. I uh, have taught for about 18 years in theological education, but I have never been so tired uh, in my life in the last two years. Um, met, met Lam. For those of you who, in the, I don't know how many of you recognize what I've just said there and been amazed. I tire, so forget the, the verb tense, right? Am I tired? I tire, um, and and I have uh, I've I've had to pause to think about what are the things that legislate legislate how I tire, or how I'm supposed to feel tired, or how I'm supposed to overcome my tiredness. Um, we're supposed to tell stories to one another. Uh, in, in, in short periods of time this evening. And so I have a story um, that really doesn't have a point. I think that's what stories are supposed to be, right? There's not like a nice punchline at the end, um, but I wanna kind of throw out a couple of like ideas, uh, words and expressions that came to mind as I worked my way to this very familiar story for me. Um, the idea of uh, rigidity and resilience. Rigidity, many of us think that that's a bad word but I looked up some definitions and I, I, it tickled me when I came across something that said something about the unwillingness to be bent out of shape. That got me crack up a little bit. I mean, just think, play with that uh, for a while, but then pair that with resilience, which is also, you know, has more uh, cachet these days, especially during pandemic time or multiple pandemics. But what does it mean to imagine the capacity of a strained body to recover its size and shape after deformation caused by, especially by compressive stress. 
just think about that resilience, right? And then I think of trailblazers as way markers, a marker of ways or on the ways showing distance and direction, right? And then I think about Anne Chang's ornamentalism. Can something about, I mean, it kind of, it was, she just blew my mind thinking about uh, the peri humanity of Asian femininity, right? Asian American uh, feminism is what I would, add, I would add to this. That quote, a peculiar state of being produced out of the fusion between thingliness and personness, end quote, right? Peri humanity of Asian femininity and our organic and fleshness as opposed to a synthetic uh, thingness, right? That's all, kind of all of those things have been kind of swirling in my mind as I think about the legislation of how tired I've been. So the story in a nutshell, um, the story that has really transformed has become an event horizon for me as I think about theological education, which is what I've been asked to share about, you know, perspectives on the challenges of theological education from, from the, the, the vantage point of our organic embodiment in fleshness. Um, it was 2014, right? The colleagues who know me, friends who know me might, might have heard me or, or um, um, uh, seen articulations of that in, in my writing. But it was, it was an event where I was stressed and stretched beyond my capacity, uh, beyond my know-how, feeling completely incompetent, completely out of place, completely swept over, like knocked off my feet. And yet it reoriented me in a way uh, and, and repurposed my sense of of my contribution to theological leadership and theological education. It was when I volunteered to be a so-called marshal, a de-escalator, a peacekeeper, as you, as you call it, in um, one of those Moral Monday protests in Ferguson, Missouri, about 15 miles away from where I was teaching, which was um, Webster Groves uh, in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, it was a Moral Monday march uh, in the wake of uh, kind of a uh, Ferguson uprising, Ferguson October and the movement of Black Lives Matter, a movement of resistance in the wake of the shooting death of a young Michael Brown, right? I volunteered for the first time to be a, a marshal, not knowing what I was supposed to do, joining much younger uh, movement leaders, you know, to get trained. We wore bandanas in order to mark that we, you know, were supposed to leave the crowd. I mean, I, um, here, you know, I am the short little thing next to young, sprightly movement leaders trying to figure out what I was supposed to do. Our job was to um, create buffer, a buffer between marchers, protesters, and clergy leaders who uh, were willing to, to be arrested, right, to be on the front lines, right? So here, um, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me condense this story in the inter in interest of time. We, we lined up outside of a church. It was a United Methodist church waiting for demonstrators um, to gather themselves inside. They were praying, they were coaching one another, they were kind of giving instructions, we're waiting quietly outside, news media behind us, right? And then all of a sudden, you, you can, you, 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 you kind of this, this silence. And then the doors of the church flung open and they came out, right? In, 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 in rows, um, arms locked, um, marching towards us. And I'm thinking to myself, like, what do we do? What do we do, right? How do, do, we, do we back up, right? So they're, 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 this procession came out of the church, right? And they started singing. They started singing loud, uh, louder and louder. And it was that spiritual that you know, we're familiar with. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. And then we backed up, they moved forward. And like, you know, when we're looking around trying to figure out like, do we you know, turn around and walk ahead of them or do we, or what do we do? And, and I'm, I'm not kidding you, literally, they just kind of swept over us. It was like a tide of people that swept over us and I had to duck under the arms, right? And so it was like a feeling of me being swallowed by a crowd of people who were moving forward with conviction, with purpose, with a sense of direction, right? And destination. And I heard faintly from amongst the crowd, a voice that said to me, come join us, sweetheart. <laughs> um, that has stayed with me because I'm thinking, you know, at first I was incensed. I was like, who dare call me sweetheart, right? You know, so the feminist sensibility in me, right? And then, and then it was an invitation. It was a, it was a, it was a, 
a, a, a spirit moment for me. What, what, I, what was I being invited to join, right? Um, uh, that question haunted me quite a bit. And then that moment, skip over a little bit to a moment where I, um, again, the, the marshals uh, locking arms in order to create a buffer between right, the marchers and the clergy in front of us. And we were stretched so thin because the crowd was so, so, so massive and expansive that I, I, I could barely hang on to the arms and the hands of the people, my colleagues around me. And it was, it was amazing in the sense that when we felt like our bodies could not be stretched further, somebody would come up and grab our, our hand and extend the line, right? And so bodies reconnected to one another in order to, to protract ourselves, right? To create a kind of collective resilience that moment um, for somebody who had no, no sense of what she was supposed to do in that moment. It was a powerful moment of mimesis, right? Kind of learning kinesthetically and, and, and being extended bodily by those around me and being um, uh, evoked and provoked by questions that uh, invited me to think about why was I there? Um, was I uh, an ornamental uh, piece to a movement or was I an organic enfleshment of a movement? And how did that change what I had been prepared to do back in the seminary, you know, my classes, my syllabi, you know, and then the goals and the objectives the whole semester, all that changed in that moment for me. Um, I wonder how often we allow moments like that, events, horizons like that to repurpose us, reorient us, uh, to protract us, right? Beyond our capacity in order to um, 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 kind of invite us to think about the balance between rigidity and resilience about, right? Uh, about uh, our sense of distance and destination and how we, we ourselves are marking that in our journeys. Um, as theological educator. So let me stop there and invite my other colleagues to share their stories. Yeah, Mayan, thank you so much for sharing your story. And then especially I learned a lot from Mayan about um, collective ethnography. We are telling our stories, but we always tell our stories with our communities. And certainly like I can relate myself to your story and thank you so much for sharing powerful story. And our next speaker is Rita Nakishima Brock. And many of you already know her and she is one of our founding members. Um, Rita, how have you been? I've been mixed. <laughs> um, in some ways, there, uh, when there's such a massive global crisis like a pandemic that's unprecedented, it brings out extremes. And so there's parts of my how I am that are um, full of sadness and disappointment and tiredness. Um, one of the things that I had planned to do before the pandemic was to attend the Tokyo Olympics and go back to Japan. I haven't been back in a long time. And, um, and it, between the last time I was there and now, um, I've connected with one of my cousins that I grew up with till I was six. And he was going to organize a reunion of all the cousins that I haven't seen since I was six uh, as part of my trip to the Olympics. And Gail Yi and I had bought tickets to advance and we had a place to stay in Tokyo and then it got postponed and then now we, we can't go. So that's been uh, sad for me. Um, I, I was really looking forward to all of the things I was going to get to do in Japan. Um, and I also this year lost a family member and couldn't go, there was no, no service and um, that was very sad. Um, and I was also really disappointed that Pan Autumn didn't get to have our 35th anniversary celebration last year. Um, I have been in Pan Autumn for exactly half my life. Um, I'm 70, I'll be 71 this year. And, and it meant a lot that, I, I, that this, this organization has lasted that long and been in my life for such a long time. And we had so many great plans for the 35th year um, to celebrate this amazing organization and we didn't get to do it. 
Um, so I was sad about that. Um, but then there are other things that probably wouldn't have happened in my life had it not been for this awful time um, and being confined at home. Like um, around June, I realized that this was gonna go on a lot longer than I ever thought it would. And I live alone and I needed company. And so I got a kitten. Um, and I probably wouldn't have done that had it not been that I needed company. And, and um, I'm really glad I did it. She's wonderful. It's just been a huge thing to cheer me up and make me go outside every day because she likes to walk on a leash outside. Um, and the other thing that happened was that Pan Autumn decided as part of our 35th anniversary that we were gonna become a 501c3. We were gonna finally, after all these years, be our own organization rather than being hosted by another organization that collected money for us. Um, and um, so I'm just gonna sh share a picture of the group that met, that discussed all of this in Denver. Um, was it um, almost two years ago now, um, and uh, and decided to take the leap. And in taking the leap, uh, the the gift of that process, even without the 35th anniversary, was that because we needed to create a real board and have officers and committees and things, we have actually been meeting a lot more often than we otherwise would have been doing between annual conferences. Um, and because we needed to regroup and start planning to do things online. And so um, it's been actually really wonderful to be looking forward to seeing everybody and knowing that I'm going to get to see the people on the board um, and meet with committees and things um, much more often than I did before. Uh, so that's been a plus. I'm grateful for that. I'm also grateful for the fact that I have a couple of friends I've known for over half my life. Um, and we usually vacation together or see each other once a year. Um, and because of COVID, we started meeting every Friday evening for cocktail hour. And th that has just been wonderful. We actually um, feel like we all, we, we got each other through this, um, but that it may become a regular thing now because it's meant so much to us to be meeting every week. Um, and then there are just, the, and the work I've been doing, I've been really busy at work. I, I've been busier than I've been in a long time um, because I work for a social service nonprofit and we have frontline workers doing senior care and we have healthcare workers. And, um, and the, the work I do is to help try to alleviate their moral distress. And so we created a program online and, uh, and that's starting to grow and we got contracts with other companies that want us to offer it. Um, so it'll actually be my workshop tomorrow. I'm gonna um, explain it and it's open to the public and people can use it. Um, so that it's the, the work I've been doing has been really wonderfully rewarding. Um, and, uh, and I'm now working with Christine Chong as my um, program assistant. Uh, and it's been a pleasure to have someone else to work with who understands um, my uh, approach to things and is so talented. Uh, and so I'm grateful for that as well. And I don't know um, if I would have done that uh, without COVID sort of pushing me into it because I had so much extra work to do. And then I'm just gonna finish by saying that um, I feel more hopeful about um, change, real change for justice, um, economic justice, racial justice, gender justice, all, all the forms of justice that most of us have been working our whole adult lives on. Um, I feel more hopeful than I felt in maybe 45 years, 40, 45 years, um, that, uh, that, that more change is possible because it got so bad that it was obvious, just so blatantly obvious how much was wrong with American culture and society that um, people, and people didn't have entertainment. They didn't have live sports. They couldn't avoid the news. They couldn't avoid seeing all these awful things like the murder of George Floyd and the healthcare system overwhelmed and all of these terrible things. And so, um, and we, we got lucky, we got rid of our bad government. Um, so, I, so I feel actually 
hopeful and I'm actually looking forward to finally when we can be out again and meet and, uh, and begin to organize. And I don't want to go back to normal. I want to go back to something new and different that's better than normal. So that's how I am. I'm actually sort of hopeful. Thank you, Rita. I am hopeful too. And Rita um, has told Panaram a very important theological, feminist theological concept, um, which, which is interstitial integrity. And all of us are familiar with that concept right now. Our next guest is Sister Mary John Manansan. Sister Mary John is joining us from Manila, Philippines. So it's about 8.29 in the morning. Are you in Manila or a different city? Manila, it's 8.26 right now. Okay. Sister Mary John, how have you been? Well, I've never been so busy in my life. I thought that uh, with this pandemic, I would have nothing to do but, you know, rest. But it's it's not so. I have webinars almost every day, two or three times even. <laughs> and of course, with all this red tagging and all, all of these things, you know, I, I'm busier than ever. <laughs> I, I cannot understand how, how it happened that way, but that's how it is. But I can tell you this story afterwards when I, I give my talk, no? Uh, I live in the, in the campus of St. Scholastica's College, it is three and a half hectares, and we have two communities here. The Priory community where the Priory lives, and my community, which runs the school. Anyway, what I'm going to tell you is that we were direct hit by the, pan by the virus uh, last December. What happened was, you know, our young sisters, uh, since the, since the, the uh, lockdown started, uh, they, they uh, distribute food all over Manila. At first, uh, we had lineups here in front of our chapel, but then afterwards, we know that there are so many more people hungry uh, there in, out in the streets. So we decided to, to send uh, our vans to, to the different places. And that's how we got, our young sisters got infected. And of course, uh, the people that they are with were infected. That is in the priory community because there are most young sisters there. Only one of my sisters in my community, we are 10, was also positive. So all in all, there were 22 positive uh, cases in our campus, you know, uh, 12 were sisters and 10 were uh, uh, staff people, cooks and caregivers and all that. So we were locked down by the, by the barangay, we call that the local government. And of course, we sent all our sisters and, and our uh, staff to the hospital. So they were there for 14 days. And after 14 days, when they uh, recovered, we sent them to our retreat house in Tagaytay. Uh, that is a cooler place. And so that's for a whole month, the priory community was totally uh, deserted. But in my community, we continued our community prayers and all that because we were nine. But we, of course, had to observe all the, all the what we call this, the health uh, programs that were imposed no so we had distancing and we had uh, uh, our lunch and our uh, meals were were individual not together and all that now what i can say is that now we have recovered and in fact i i interviewed three of our sisters who had were positive i have a show called i have a tv talk show it's called nonsense makes sense so I interviewed them and what came out of that is that when I asked the three of them how they felt and they said it's like, oh, you know, we have survived something and therefore what we feel is a sense of a sense of uh, victory, a sense of, uh, you know, uh, our trust in God uh, has been strengthened. And so I also feel that way because nobody died, no? I mean, everybody survived. And so... For me, it, it was a, a kind of a revival of hope, revival of trust and, uh, and optimism. And therefore, it's like our, because we, used, we were almost panicking and we were almost, you know, uh, paranoid <laughs> in everything. But now, because we survived it, we realized that whatever comes, we will survive. That is our pandemic story. 
Now I go to the I go to the red tagging, okay? Uh, in the short term of of um, Duterte, who is worse than your Trump, I'm sorry to say, but he is worse. No, in the span of four years, there has developed in the Philippines a culture of death. All the solutions are in Tagalog, patayin, patayin, kill, kill, kill. That is from the mouth of the president. So there's an all-out war and and uh, a lot of measures that are terrible are, are just coming one after the other, no? So a, a little, a little uh, pic uh, some pictures because they are louder than words, as you see there, no? And then, of course, the latest events is the passage and signing of the Anti-Terrorist Act. But actually, they are not anti-terrorists. They are anti-dissenters, no? So it is being questioned now in, uh, in the Supreme Court. And um, I am one of the protesters. We, we are 37 petitioners to, to really condemn the anti-constitutional the anti um, uh, uh, provisions of this act. I can talk one hour about that. And then, of course, the threat of passing the death penalty act. And then the silencing of press broad, uh, you know, they, they took away the, the ABS-CBN uh, uh, franchise. Now, the killing of Randy Chanes and Zara, that is about uh, three months ago. Just last week, uh, we called it the Bloody Sunday, 11 people were killed, including two of our uh, mission partners in, in the indigenous people's uh, territory in Tanay, no? So they have what they call war on the enemies of the state. Now, who are the enemies of the state? Of course, they say communists is the greatest uh, threat to the country, but actually they are they are not uh, targeting the what they call this the uh, uh, the what they call subversive, but legitimate political dissenters, including critics uh, against human rights abuses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera including the rural missionaries. Can you imagine these are sisters, rural missionaries. They, they are a group of uh, sisters who, who, who work in the rural areas. And now they have been, uh, they have been branded and now uh, even their finances, they, they had been closed, you know. And of course, there is the red tagging of church people, not only me. So there is a constant campaign to silence church people, bishops, Bishop Sok, Pabilio, Ambu David, etc., priests like Robert Reyes, uh, Plabi, and so forth. And Sister Pat, of course, was was uh, exiled, <laughs> was uh, actually uh, thrown out of the country. She's an Australian who had been here for more than 30 years. She is about 72 years old, and they, she is considered enemy of the state, no? They, they interpret the separation of church and state, which is in our constitution, but they, they say the, the church has nothing to do with the state. But that's not the way it is really written in the constitution. It is addressed to the state, not to interfere with the beliefs of people. No? So it is not only the right, I, I consider, it's not only the right, but the duty of the church to make moral judgment regarding socio-political issues. That is what I am following. I have the right and the duty to make moral judgment regarding social political uh, issues. Because I always say, you know, when I entered the convent, I did not give up my Filipino citizenship. Therefore, if I am a citizen of the Philippines, I have the right to critique anything that I see that is wrong. Now, my actually, I had been <laughs> I had been red tagged all my life almost because I started my activism in 1975. When I saw the brutality of the of the metrocom at the time, that's the police against striking workers of a wine factory, Latundena, I really saw them beat up the workers. I saw them bloodied and all that. And from that time on, I said, no, that cannot be. I cannot allow this, these uh, people who are just fighting for their rights to be oppressed like that. And because this, these uh, workers live in slum areas, then I got involved with the slum areas. And at that time, uh, Imelda Marcos wanted all the slum areas to be to be uh, to be um, taken away because George Hamilton is coming and all these people, this uh, whatever the, the celebrities, no. And then I became involved with the farmers because the farmers are the ones who come to the to the city in order to have jobs. So then we got involved in land re in in land reform, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I have been actually I have a long experience of harassment by trolls. 
uh, we have an uh, association called Movement Against Tyranny, and my job is always to invite people to rallies by a five-minute video. And every time I put up a video uh, inviting people to the to rallies, then I have so many blogs, I mean, uh, for or against. One time it was one million, half of them were trolls, no? So, uh, and, and and it's really uh, terrible how they, how they, um, critique you it's it's very person it's below the belt you are a fake sister you you need exorcism do you like to be raped all that comes out from the troll you know uh, and of course they photoshop me with fake news they for example they put a picture of me and the picture of a npa woman and they put something like that which is really photoshop because i never put any anything around my neck and it says there uh, I am supporting, and then the name of that girl, and then the girl is shown uh, with with a gun, you know. And one time there was even a picture of me there, and then it says there, uh, I am support. Joma is my boss. Joma is the, is the chairperson of the Communist Party, and I'm supposed to be saying that Joma is my boss, that I am taking orders from him. That is, those are the kind of Photoshop fake news that that are put in the FB, put in the in in all the social media no and now of course the one that really took attention was when um, the spokesperson of a committee called committed to to uh to eliminate communism in the philippines now the spokesperson of that is a is a woman called lorraine badoy and when he when she was the one who red tagged me now that really took this because she is an official of the government no and she said that because I, I am a chair, I was the chairperson of Gabriela, and therefore all the uh, uh, officers of uh, so-called uh, uh, communist, um, what they call that, uh, they, they call us uh, communist allies or something like that, they must be high-ranking communist party members. So, so many things they say, I am a muse of the NPA. Can you imagine that? I am the muse of the NPA, and I am a, a high-ranking a communist party member, etc. And then there is this uh, this uh, reporter who is really not really having a good uh, reputation as uh, a journalist, Roberto Tiglau. And what is terrible is that she is the husband of of my friend, who whom I work with for the Women Crisis Center. But then he he writes all these articles about me that um, yes that uh, he knows that. Uh, that when I become a I become a Gabriela chairperson, I have to put my hand on the red book or something like that, no? So the trigger point actually was when I condemned the conviction of Maria Reza. Maria Reza is a, that that uh, famous journalist who is really not only red tag but uh, they accuse her of so many things. She has about eight cases in court, and I defended her. And and you know what happened is that. Uh, the retal retaliation was really this thing of Lorraine Badoy and, and Roberto Tiglau, no? So, and then they also said that I use liberation theology against the government, that I should go to the hills to join the NPA, that I am a, a news of the NPA. You know my reaction? I do not dignify them with an answer, not directly anyway. So what I did was... What I did was I put on my oh, because what happened was uh, I got so many so many solidarity uh, messages from all over the world. My goodness, thousands and thousands, you know, from Asia, Africa, Latin America, uh, Germany, Europe. In fact, the Misho Misho Aachen, who is my partner in in the Institute of Women's Studies, they even went to their foreign affairs uh, to intervene for my case or something like that, no? And they really rallied all the all the NGOs in Germany, no? So what I did was to thank, just to thank all the all the people who uh, did solidarity messages for me. And of course, I also made some kind of, uh, you know, some uh, reduction of absurd, absurd, if I call it. I put in my blog, uh, Joma, attention Joma, Joma is the Communist Party supposed to be chairperson who is in Netherlands, I said. Attention, Joma and comrades. Do you know that according to Tiglau, the continued existence of the Communist Party is because of me? My God, I'm super duper uh, powerful. I said like that. How come you do not thank me? I said like that. And you high-ranking Communist Party members, I'm supposed to be 
a high-ranking Communist Party member, why don't you, uh, why don't you acknowledge me? I want, I, why do you not invite me to your meetings? How unfair! I said. Well, if they are not stupid, they, they would know that. How could I say something like that if I am really a member? No. So anyway, that's how I. But then one time somebody told me, you better answer them because they might think that oh, your joke is true. So I said, excuse me. The, if a if a fly bothers you, will you sue it? And if a mosquito bites you, will you will you uh, will you accuse that mosquito in court? In other words, for me, they are just mosquitoes and and flies, no. So, but of course, uh, some people said you're so good at at at, at uh, sar sarcastic remarks. Also, I said, well, that is the only way I can I can I can really answer them without dignifying them because I don't consider them really that serious, no. Okay. Now, the experience gave me an occasion to reflect on why I choose to be a political activist. Actually, it has a theological root, a very simple one. And it is this, Christ had an option for the poor, not only the rich who are poor, but economically poor. As Christian, I am a follower of Christ. And as a religious, I am supposed to be a radical follower of Christ. Therefore, I should also have an option for the poor. And if the poor are oppressed, marginalized, and exploited, I have to be on their side in solidarity with them in all the possibilities I could do this. So, of course, I, I, I do structural analysis. I can use Marx uh, for my, as a structural analysis of society because he is a good sociologist. But he is not the inspiration of what I'm doing. No, So my inspiration is spiritual. There is a tendency to dichotomize activism and, and being contemplative between action and prayer. But this is a false dichotomy and an artificial contradiction. Actually, my Benedictine motto, I'm a Benedictine, is ora et labora, pray and work. According to Thomas Merton, contemplation is the soil out of which prophecy grows. So where do I get my strength? Where do I get my courage? Where do I get my daring uh, to fight against uh, corruption and violation of human rights? It is, from, it is rooted in my contemplation. And I believe uh, this is what I did. Uh, I, I uh, what do you call this? I put together a mystic is a prophet in contemplation, and the prophet is a mystic in action. That is how I see uh, my life. No, for me the challenge today, especially for church people, is a call to prophecy, to announce the good news, to denounce the bad news, to stand up and speak out. So I, I urge all my, my church uh, brothers and sisters to act with courage because just as fear is infectious, so is courage. And as Jesus said, take courage, I have overcome the world. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Mary Zahn. Thank you so much for your powerful story. And then I see some of reflections on um, chat box and a lot of people share, the, some, some people share the memories of spending time with you in Manila. And then all of them said, you've never aged. And <laughs> you've never been silent, <laughs> silent either. But Mayan, um, what is your last word for us? <laughs> That's a lot of pressure, Christine. Um, I, am, I am profoundly grateful and struck by our interconnectedness. Um, the fact that my family spent a little over five months in the refugee transition camp in Bataan, Philippines. I'm not sure if I'm even pronouncing it right, but I, I thought about that uh, and I thought of that as a possibility to share tonight. And I, I, don't, I don't know, um, I've not met uh, Sister um, Mary John before, uh, but Rita's work, you know, my first, my introduction to Asian feminist theology was, was Rita. Uh, and Proverbs of Ashes, right, continue to haunt me. Um, the, the fact that, that you know, your presence, virtual or material, spiritual or corporal, have deeply um, shaped us all. That's just amazing to experience, so thank you. So uh, one of the things that came up in our group, and I think it's, it's uh, true for me too, um, is that the, the last year has changed me a lot. And I didn't expect to just, I mean, I, I, I sort of thought I would be healthy and survive it, but I, I, and get through it, but I, it's, it isn't just getting through it. 
um, there's there's more that happened to me uh, uh, around um, a deeper sense of gratitude, first of all, for what I have, but also a deeper sense of sorrow for the world and my own country. Um, uh, and uh, a tempering of what is my tendency to be really optimistic. Um, uh, it's sort of how I've had to cope with living in a, growing up in a military family and having a pretty unstable life where I didn't really have a home. We just moved a lot. Um, and uh, so you sort of cope with that by just keep moving forward. And that's, that's changed for me. Um, and, and several people in our, our group also talked about how much their ambitions and ideas about what the future would be have been radically uh, reshaped. And, and I feel that as well. Um, so, uh, and I think that that's, a, I mean, if we haven't been changed, if, we, if we're not affected by, by uh, the amount of suffering the world has gone through and is still going through, um, there's probably something wrong with us. Thank you. Thank you for always, I always thank you for sharing wise words and uplifting our spirit. Um, Sister Mary John Mananzan, who no one can silence. Well, I'm so happy to be with these wonder women theologians. No, I am so happy because there are so many uh, young people like you. Uh, we with Kokpilan and Rita, we, I'm sure we are also full of hope uh, about the future of feminist theology because of these uh, young people. As I said in my in my breakout uh, uh, group, that I feel like my I, I feel like I am with my grandchildren <laughs> because we are we are the grandmas. I am 83 years old. If you do not know, I am 83 years old and fighting. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm still full of energy, and I don't know why why I have so much energy. But but seeing all of you and and uh, you know listening to you, it gives me more uh, energy still, and and happy to be a feminist theologian and an Asian feminist theologian. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed being with you. Thank you for joining us today, Sister Manansan, and then and also. It's interesting because I'm actually very happy to see very young faces. So I don't know, it's good to hear that. Um, yeah, age is relative. I don't feel young, but I was just so happy and excited to see young people and new generation emerging. And as long as new generation emerging, Panadam always have hope and we keep going and we, we have been making great history. Um take a long deep breath and pull it way down in your lungs and feel your belly pooch out from so much air and then to let it out very slowly through your mouth so take a deep breath and then let it out slowly through your mouth take one more And then on the third breath, make a sound as you're, you're exhaling, a sigh or a hum. As you go forth for your evening or morning or day, remember the faces you saw tonight, the words you heard tonight, the connections you made tonight. May they sustain you as you depart and may you return back to this space from a good night's sleep, renewed and ready to be with us again tomorrow. Go in peace and Take care of yourself. Amen. <laughs>